Hi, I'm Marcellus Reynolds, the author of Supreme Models, Iconic Black Women Who Revolutionize Fashion, and you're listening to So Booking Cool with Jewel B. Welcome to So Booking Cool, it's Jewel B. This is part two of my conversation with author Marcellus Reynolds about his new and debut book, Supreme Models, Iconic Black Women Who Revolutionized Fashion. Did you get to check out part one? If not, you need to get on that. It was a great chat, very insightful, and this part is no different. In part two, we learn more about the creative process of Supreme Models. So many interesting tidbits that we learned from Marcellus about his book. This is also the part of the interview where things do get emotional when we learn more about Marcellus's background and his childhood. So without further ado, let's get into part two with author Marcellus Reynolds, only on So Booking Cool. Five, four, three, two, one. You know, what's your first job? Because I understand that that was at a high end women's boutique and you were you were 16. So I wanted to know, like, was that a deliberate choice to to get a job that involved fashion and clothing or did it find you? It was my first job, which I got at 15. I lied about my age. It was <laughs> happenstance. A friend's sister. I bumped into a friend's sister. I was actually out shopping. And I bumped into a friend's sister. I'd gone to grammar school with her, with her sister. And she was like, oh, my God, Marcella, look how, look how big you are, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah. She was like, what are you doing? I was like, nothing. I go to Kenwood, you know, go to my high school. And she was like, oh, my God, like, are you looking for a job? And I was like, I guess, because I wasn't looking for a job. I was happy, you know, living off my mama. <laughs> um, and she was like, oh, well, we're looking for a staff boy. Let me introduce you to come by the store in Water Tower and, and meet my boss. And so I, like, sort of looked into it. But it was it was destiny in a weird way because, <laughs> you know, I loved fashion and I loved women. So what was better than working in a woman's clothing store? And these women sort of took me under their um, wing and taught me everything. Like, literally everything I am, I owe to, like, these women and that happy ac- ac- accident of Alicia hiring me as a salesperson or getting me the job as a salesperson at a woman's boutique. And I started as a stock boy. But being the only male in a woman's clothing store, all the women would be like, what do you think of this? And I would be like, oh, my gosh, that's fantastic. Go a size down. Oh, my God, I love it. It comes in red also. Oh, my God, did you see this? And wear it with that. And I would be doing that instead of, like, dusting or vacuuming or changing a light bulb. Or I would be doing it while I was doing that. And this wonderful woman, my boss, um, saw that. And she was like, you know what? We're underutilizing you. You should be on the sales floor. And she made me a salesperson. And I was like, I think I was like one of two male salesperson in a salespeople in a store, like a, a chain of 100 stores. And then when I really started concentrating on it, I became like the number two salesperson in the company. It was crazy. I was making more money than my mother made. I was still in high school. Wow. I was working, I was working part time because the store was part commission. So if you told me, so this week it was like, you know, $20 if you sell five, you know, cashmere sweaters. I would sell 200 cashmere sweaters. You know what I mean? It was like, If you sell a leather jacket, you get $50 extra. And I would be in there. I would be, like, knee-deep in the the leather section selling jackets one after the other. So, um, yeah, I was, like, making some cake and didn't didn't realize I was making cake because I was turning my checks over to my mother. You know, because, you you know, when your mother kind of realizes what's happening, she was like, um, you need to be paying rent. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, well, if I'm paying rent, I'm not listening to a word you say. (laughs) Which didn't go over very well. (laughs) (laughs) I I just, I love, I love that story. That, that is amazing. You were, you were killing it. You were in your element and they saw, they saw that they absolutely were underutilizing you. Like, hey, like you, you, you're, you can do way more. You can do way more than change the light bulbs and, and vacuum. And it just worked out for you. And then even was it, yeah, what are you going to say? 
gave the opportunity. She gave me yeah. the opportunity. She gave me a shot. I mean, it worked out for her. The stores were highly competitive. So if you've got a good salesperson that's got that's building a clientele that is, you know, coming back week after week for them, you know, then to, to be around them, to talk to them, to and I would be on the phone. As soon as I walked in, I would get my clientele book. I would look and see what came in new. And then I would get my clientele book out, and I would get on that phone, and I would be like, Melody, girl, we got this leather skirt in that I know you would love. You can wear it with that Norma Kamali shirt you got last week. It also works with their blah, blah, blah you got on your layaway. Come on in, girl. I'm going to put this skirt on a hold for you. I'm only going to hold it for you until Friday. So you better get in here, you know. Mm. And I <laughs> and, and, so I would spend the first part of my day, my shift, on the phones, working the phone, and then I would get out there on that floor, and I would be like, what's on special today? What we got, what's our, you know, I would be like, okay, what's the store goal for the day? And where are we? You know, where are we in, in, in terms of the goal? And then I would be like, okay, sell. <laughs> Just go. And it was a bunch of girls there that, like, loved me and, and, and loved what we were doing. We all loved the job and it was fun and we laughed and we played and we kidded with each other and God, it was amazing. It was probably one of the best experiences I've ever had, especially because my childhood was very rough and I still lived at home on the South side and I was still being bullied and I was still being teased. Right. South side of Chicago, right? South side of Chicago. So to leave the South side, go to the North side and be completely accepted for the whole total being I was when I wasn't accepted in my home and in my neighborhood and honestly by people that looked at me, looked like me, was like actually kind of wonderful. You know, it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, it, it was what I needed. It saved my life. Wow. It really saved my life. Trust me, there were days when I was a child where I was like, I'm done with this. Wow. Is there any moment in particular that stands out to you where you where you felt that way, but you were able to overcome it, wanting to be done? Oh, I tried to commit suicide when I was 10. I say it very cavalierly now because I'm dealing with it, um, um, because I'm, uh, I'm sort of dealing with it. And it's a lot of that stuff has come up with the book, because I have been saying to a lot of people that it's that I didn't write this book. Ten-year-old Marcellus wrote this book. This little boy that loved women and clothes and fashion and pretty things. And he was the boy that sat in front of the television and fantasized about his life. So I watched shows like um, The Love Boat. And I was like, ooh, that black guy's a bartender on a boat. I could be a bartender on a boat. I watched movies like uh, Cleopatra Jones and the Temple of Gold with Tamara Dobson, or the Casino of Gold. And she was a cop, and she wore couture, and she beat people up. And I thought, I could be a cop. And I watched Mahogany a million times. And Diana Ross was a fashion stylist who gets discovered on the south side of Chicago, and she gets whisked away to Rome and becomes a world-famous model. And I thought, I could go to Rome, and I could be a model. And I went to my grandmother's encyclopedia, because back then, every black house had an encyclopedia. You might be missing letters, but you had an encyclopedia. And I looked up Rome, and Rome is in Italy. And people that live in Italy speak Italian. And maybe one day I'll go to Italy, and I'll speak Italian. That's how I processed everything. And I would read Ebony and Jet from cover to cover because in every black household back then, you got both those magazines. You got your Ebony once a month. You got your Jet every week. And I would read those magazines cover to cover. And that's where I discovered that black people could be politicians and they could be debutantes and they could be doctors because I wasn't seeing that around me. You know what I mean? I was seeing like maybe black teachers and then my grandfather owned a very small construction company. He was a mason. So I knew that you could be a construction worker, but I mean, who wanted to do that? I was a little gay kid. Um, so, but I was like sucking it up, but I was also sucking it up because every time I left my house, 
I was being terrorized. So I had to have this elaborate fantasy life to get through the horror that I was experiencing on a daily basis mm -hmm. from the people around me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I grew up with a cousin that was very close to me in age, and I grew up with a brother that was right behind him. And we fought all the time. But you fight with your brother and you fight with your siblings. So I grew up willing to fight and knowing how to fight. But then when the bullies figured out that you would fight back, it wasn't one bully. It would be a group of bullies. So I was beat up and chased home constantly. I was called things that I never want to repeat. Before I even knew that I was gay, people assumed I was gay because I was nice and I was clean and I was theatrical and I was kind. Um, and, 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 and unfortunately, the things that are special about you when you were a child, and I don't know if this is across every race, but the things that were special about me as a child were the things that people tried to beat out of me. Mm -hmm. People teased me because I was well-spoken. Oh, you you talk like a white person. Oh, look at you, you're trying to be white. No, I got an A in English. Um, no, I read because I need to get out of the, the, the horror that surrounds me every day. The drugs, the gangs, the violence, the poverty. So I read and I go places in my mind. Um, so wow. that's why I wrote the book. That's why, that's why 10 year old Marcellus wrote the book. Because for me, these magazines, these movies, these journeys that I took in my mind took me places that let me get past the horror that I was experiencing on a daily basis, both inside and outside my house. That's why diversity matters. Little black kids need to see them represented in a beautiful way so that they can dream. Little girls need to see themselves represented in a beautiful way so that they can think that they can be more than just pretty. You know, they, they need to see themselves as doctors and lawyers and biochemists and, 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 and athletes. That's for every race. And that's why I wrote this book, and that's what the book is about. For me, the book is a celebration of di diversity because I want some little – and that's why the book is so cheap. People keep telling me every day this book is too cheap. Mm -hmm. I priced this book really inexpensively, and Abrams, thank God, believes in the same way that I do, because I want some little black girl that wants to be a model or loves fashion to be able to go to the store and buy this book. Maybe she saves her allowance up for two, three, four weeks, and she buys this book. Or if she says to her mama, Mama, I want to be a fashion designer. Mama, I want to be a model. I want to be a hair and makeup artist. Her mother goes to Barnes and Noble and buys this book for her. This book could have been a two hundred, three hundred dollar Toshin book or a Rizzoli book. When I signed with Abrams, we we were both on the same page, my publisher and I, and we wanted this book to be under sixty dollars, and we made it fifty dollars because of that. I'm not going to make money off of this book. I spent my savings, I spent my advance. I took out credit cards to finish it. The licensing fees would double what we estimated them for. But if this book makes one person happy and they see it and they go, I'm beautiful too, then this book is worth it. Listen, Marcellus, Marcellus, first of all, I just want to say, even without knowing you personally, but I know a lot of people would also agree. I'm so glad that you did not give up on yourself. I'm so glad because like you, like you are clearly extraordinary and what you're doing, like, and like even, you know, just helping to, to put that model back together when that was a very like unpleasant and just like immoral experience on set and, and you being really generous with the price point for supreme models and and what it, the impact that that it can have around the world for people like that's just that's magnificent like that's that's wonderful and it is it's a beautiful beautiful book you know honoring models past and present and 75 models i believe are are, are honored over 100 stunning images it's it's just it's not even just like perfect for the coffee table. It's, it's great for the soul as well. And <laughs> thank you. Oh yeah. I, I have got to stop crying all the time. God. <laughs> Bethan was like, Bethan was like, 
boy, I don't want to see no tears on this stage of Cameron. You better spread them shoulders off. <laughs> <laughs> I have been a mess. <laughs> and and by the way, you like, know, yeah, go on, go on. It's eight years of my life, so it's just, you know, I came up with the idea in 2011, and it's so odd that it happened, you know, it's, it's it's wonderful to see, but it's not. It's also wonderful that it's being received so beautifully. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. it's like a, a sort of thought. Oh, I'd write a book, and then you know, yeah, I write a, I wrote a book, you know, yay, and, then, and I didn't know what to expect after, and I have no expectations from it. But it's wonderful that it's being received in this way. It's, uh, I'm getting tons of text messages and DMs and emails from people, and they're like. We didn't know that this was the book we needed. No, I was like, I didn't either. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and what what have been some of those powerful messages and beautiful messages that you've received for the book? Oh, my God. Gay guys love this book. It's so amazing. And, and because we love beauty and we love women and we love... Um, you know, and we always, and I think sometimes we often feel like the underdog, and the book is a celebration, maybe, of people that have been the underdogs. And and if you read some of the interviews and the bios that I wrote, it's um, it shows the triumph over adversities. And I think that that that's resonating with like with maybe gay guys and um, mm-hmm. and all the models. Oh my God! I was on the phone with Karen Alexander on. Saturday, who's an angel, oh. and you do not deserve her. And Karen interviewed, I interviewed Karen for the book, and she was very sweet. And the book has come out, and Karen has just been, like, wonderful, and she's so excited about the book. But I was telling her a story about Janelle Williams, the woman on the cover. Yes. Mm-hmm. She bought, Gorgeous. her boyfriend oh. bought five books. And so he came up to me and he was like, I need you to sign all these books. And he was like, this is from my mama. This is from my, this is for Janelle mama. This is like, and so I'm signing these books. And I was like, but five? And he's like, well, I need one for our apartment in Brooklyn. And I need one for our house in Jamaica. And I was like, okay. So I was telling Karen that story humorously. And Karen was like, oh, I thought I ordered six books. I need you to sign all of them. And I was like, six? And she was like, well, one for each of my daughters. One has to stay wrapped because my youngest daughter is still a, is still a child. So I want her to have it when she, when she grows up. And I was literally like, Karen, what are you talking about? And she was like, no, you don't understand. What you created is the document, and I'm part of it. They have to know the history. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, and every girl is saying, Shalom is like, I can't believe you chose me to be in the book. And I'm like, I didn't choose you to be in the book. You worked. You achieved something. You deserve to be in the book. And she can't see that. Janelle, too. I'm like, like, it's unbelievable. Like, it's literally unbelievable. But there's a picture that Janelle showed me of a woman in her home. And she's got her baby, her toddler, sitting on the counter. And the woman has natural hair, and she's got, like, you know, she's got it up, and it's definitely an afro. She's got it wrapped. And she's holding the book, and she's showing the book to her toddler, who's a girl. And I'm telling you, that photo destroyed me. To think that, like, some mother is showing her child this book that's a celebration of black women. And it's two black women, and it's two generations in that photo. I'm done. It's, like, <laughs> I'm toast. <laughs> it's a wrap for me. I'm like, I'm history. Like, I'm just like, uh, really? Like, <laughs> Pat Cleveland's husband reached out to me on Instagram, and he was mm. like, Pat would like you to send me, a, Pat would like a copy of the book sent to her autograph. And I was like, call me immediately. <laughs> like, Pat Cleveland is a is an angel, and the world doesn't deserve her. Like, I literally am like, what? And I told him, like, I sent her, I sent a copy of the book. Before the book came out, Abrams and I sent copies of the book to all the models in the in the book mm-hmm. to their agency. Right. So I was like, there's a book waiting for her at the agency. 
And he was like, okay, but we still need to talk about how you're going to sign it because Pat wants you to sign it. And I'm like, Pat Cleveland knows I exist? Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, that's, that's, that is just, wow, that's just mind-blowing to me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what? Like, Iman did a post. And not only did Iman do, like, an Instagram post, Hers is art directed. There's cross stage, there's music, there's like multiple. I like, yes, Iman, you better do this. <laughs> That's major. That's major. It's so crazy. And then also it's Cynthia crazy. Bailey, too, like, shout it out. Cynthia did a, a post about it. Um, Cynthia and I have been friends for a really long time, but Cynthia doesn't realize that we worked together when I was a model because she was a a Macy's girl, and I was a Macy's, she was a Macy's model. I always take girls when I'm talking about the model. <laughs> but she was a Macy's girl, and I was a Macy's boy, but I was doing juniors, jumping around while she was doing, like, the high-end stuff, even though I was probably her age. But, you know, black don't crack, so I was doing juniors right. until I was, like, 26. <laughs> um, wow. And, and and I worked a couple of times on the same set with Cynthia, so I knew who she was, and we had, had conversations on set. She didn't remember that. But since then, I've met her a couple of times. I have a reality background. Yes. As a she. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm friends with her daughter-in-law, whose husband, she was married to Peter, and I was friends with his daughter. And that's how we, like, sort of re-met and became friends. So Cynthia has known about the book for God as long as I can, as long as I've been talking about it. And she made the cut. Yeah. There's so, so many, like, Leomi Anderson, you know, if I'm saying it, like, Chanel Amon, of course, Tyra, Naomi, Jasmine Tooks, as you mentioned, Jan- Janelle Williams, who is on the cover, like, it's just, it's a, and it's great because it has, like, the, the legends in it, like, Pat Cleveland and stuff, and also, it's a, it's great, too, to discover, for people to discover models that, they might not have been familiar with as well. So it's so it's so important to have to have both. Can I can I tell you something that's really funny? But like now to, that the book is yeah. out there in the cosmos, I'm gonna tell you something really funny. Oh, well, I don't know if it's funny because it's actually kind of sad. But I thought there are all these fights that happen when you're writing a book. And you know, the writer has an idea of what he wants, but the publisher has it. your editor has an idea of what you want. But the editor is a um, is the adjunct to the editor. So basically, they're telling you what you're going to do. And you're like, I'm not going to do that. It's my book. But <laughs> the front section, the trailblazer section, right? I did not want that in the book. Oh, and that's the history. That's interesting. That's mm-hmm. the history. And I did not want that in the book because I was very clear that this book was supposed to be an art book. Now, I wanted the interview. I wanted to talk to as many models as I could, but I did not want the trailblazers. And my little 20-something editor was like, no, you need to talk about Dorothea Powell. You need to talk about Sarah Lou Heron. You need to talk about her. And I was like, no, this is not that book. <laughs> like, it's not that book. And she was like, these women were the trailblazers. They, you know, and I was like, look. And she made me write that essay. And I mm. still didn't like it because it was broken up. Because the way it was originally done was each person was broken up and they, was dis- and they were dispersed throughout the book. And I was like, I don't think you can go from a Vogue cover to an old Jet cover. You know what I mean? Because the old jet covers from the from the forties were like they like it was they were in bad condition and they were sort of out of focus. And you couldn't find like a good you know a good copy of it mm. to license it, and it was just so crazy. And finally, we sent it to the art director, and the art director was like, "Let's move all of that stuff to the front," and she sent me the layout, and that was when it made sense to me. That was when it made sense. And that's how the front, that's how the beginning is the trailblazers, then Beth Ann is the godmother, Mm -hmm. and then it goes into the Supreme, the body of the book. And I'm so happy that we did that because even though I was trying not to, I wasn't necessarily trying to write the history of the book, 
the book really does play out as the history of black women in fashion. Absolutely. But I wasn't woke. I was like, mm -mm. I want both covers and I want essence <laughs> covers and I want these art directed beautiful things, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> we fought tooth and nail about that. Wow. But here was the other thing. I was at the end of my rope, and I was done, and I had transcribed all these interviews, and I had talked to all these people, and so every time my editor would come back and she would be like, we need another interview, or we need another essay, I would be like, no, I'm done, I've written my last one. <laughs> <laughs> How many were there, like at that and point? That's how the timeline came up. I'll tell you another secret, because <laughs> I'm telling a tale. That time, the timelines that run across people's interviews in the book, mm -hmm. yeah. when I wrote a timeline, it was because I didn't want to write another essay. <laughs> you were hilarious. I was like, I'm done. I don't want to talk to nobody else. I don't want to write another book. <laughs> so, I was like, but the thing is, a bone there. <laughs> but you're, you're a great writer. Like, your writing is just... It's so eloquent. But I have written so much. Also, there are women that, that didn't make the cut, and I interviewed them. And so even those interviews were, like, made, were transcribed, and I flipped them into interviews, or I made them into essays. Mm. So there's, like, at least 10, 10 models that didn't make the cut in the book because I couldn't clear their photos that had done interviews. Um, Adia Kulabali. Shakara Ladard, who's a very good friend of mine. Damaris, what's her last name? Damaris Lewis? No, Damaris Walker, who's now on Pose. Oh. A mm -hmm. She did an interview, and her interview was wonderful. She talked about Sports Illustrated, and she didn't make the cut because I couldn't clear her photo. And um, Coco Mitchell, oh, she didn't make the cut, and I couldn't because I, um, I couldn't. Coco was more of a runway girl, and I couldn't clear her photo. I wrote a beautiful piece about Patricia Nian, um, who is legend, but she was more of a runway girl and amused to designers than she was a print girl. So it was very hard to find photos of her that ran in magazines. And so she didn't make the cut. So, like, there's, like, I'm sitting on a bunch of interviews that didn't make the cut. Because at the end of the day, it's a photo book. It's an art book. It's about the photos to me first. And then if you learn something from my words as a, as a, as a side note, great. <laughs> like, <laughs> but for me, it's an art book. And, you know, and that's one of the things, too, because, like, now people are comparing it to Barbara Summer's wonderful book, Skin Deep, which is mm. like the Bible. You know what I mean? She has the, she did, because Abram was calling it the first ever book devoted to black models. And Abrams and I felt like we talked about Barbara's book, but we felt like this is the first ever art book. It's the first ever photography book devoted exclusively to black models. And so we mm -hmm. felt like we could say that. But now that's getting sort of morphed into it's the first ever book, and it's not. Barbara Samuels, Barbara Summers, excuse me, her book is really wonderful. And her book is like really is the, is the, it's like the novel. Like if my book is like the Cliff Note, her book is like the textbook to black modeling because she really like, um, you know, um, hits every dot, you know, she hits every spot and, and, and really <laughs> goes through the chronicle of the, of the black model and their evolution up until the mid nineties when she wrote her book. And so my book sort of is, is kind of the same. It runs parallel to that book, but it's not as, it's not a novel. My book is an art book. It's a photography book that just happens to have. And, you know, and, you, an essay. yes, and you did mention that you, that you did read as a childhood. So I have a two part question. What kind of books did you like reading as a child? And would you consider writing a novel? Find out Marcellus's answer to that question and more in part three, only on So Booking Cool. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope that you enjoyed and were able to take something away from it.